Hey everyone, welcome back to Taking Care of Business. I'm Mike Katz, Executive Vice President of T-Mobile for Business. And today I've got a very special guest, Mike Sievert, the CEO of T-Mobile, who also happens to be my boss. Uh, Mike has been with T-Mobile since 2012. He joined as the Chief Marketing Officer and was a huge part in the architect of T-Mobile's Uncarrier Revolution. Before T-Mobile, Mike served in senior executive roles at multiple companies, including E-Trade, AT&T Wireless, and Microsoft. But I am so happy, Mike, to have you here. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Um, it is just great to actually see a person. So Isn't good it? to see yeah. you. Yeah, we're here at the office today, which is which is crazy. Yeah. It, you know, I can count on I think probably two hands the number of times I've been in the office since all this uh, began. There's been other ways to engage with employees in person. Um, but yeah, we haven't been making much use of the office, so it's great to be here. Great to see you. In it person. is. It, I miss it, you. I, I miss you too. It's like <laughs> you look so great in three dimensions. I'm not, I don't know what to do with myself. Um, well, you know, um, kind of speaking of you know not being in the office, you know, 2020 has been quite the year. And if you think about all of the things that have happened this year between you becoming CEO, uh, between the merger of T of T-Mobile and Sprint. Um, all of that happening with the backdrop of a big global pandemic. If you take any of those things by themselves, each one of them are kind of a career leadership challenge, each, each by themselves, let alone all happening at the same time. So one of the things I was, wanted to ask you is, as you kind of reflect back on this year, um, what are the big things that stand out to you and what are the things that you, you've been inspired by? Well, first of all, thank God we're finally reflecting back on 2020. Isn't that good? This is a year that you know we need to start that phase as soon as possible. Um, listen, I, I, half of me wonders if people are tired of hearing about how hard 2020 has been. You know what I mean? Because it's been hard for everybody, and you know we all are excited about looking forward and finding ways, maybe with vaccines and therapies that are coming very quickly, to put all this behind us. But yeah, you're right. At, here at T-Mobile, it's you know we've had a big year, and and we created this new combined company on April 1st, right as all this stuff was hitting. You know, a month into it or so uh, here in the U.S. and that obviously brought its own challenges because here we have a company with 75, 80,000 people uh, who came from two formerly different companies with different cultures and different mindsets, a lot of similarities, but not the same company. And right in the middle of this, while everybody's finding ways to cope, we said, hey, we're going to be one. And, uh, and of course, I started on that day as well, April 1st, as CEO, uh, as opposed to being president and chief operating officer, as I was on standalone T-Mobile. And so that, that was a lot at once, uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact that um, during that same period, a, a couple of months, there was just so much happening in this country outside the confines of our company, including all kinds of social unrest and a, a racial reckoning happening and, and so many other things. Um, but look, I, you know, for me, you were starting to ask, you know, what lessons have I drawn? Um, listen, show up with a great team, you know? <laughs> I mean, we've been fortunate to be able to create this company this year in these circumstances with these people. And boy, is that great, you know? Um, because I, I, I will tell you definitively that we have assembled the best leadership team and management team and team overall in the history of this industry. And you know, you think about the management challenge that we've thrown at our people this year, you know, notwithstanding you and I here at the top of the company, but the, but, but the entirety of our management team and the entirety of our team that faces customers every day, they've faced enormous challenges. We have tens of thousands of people that care for our customers and they do that in call centers and what we call our customer experience centers because we were a little behind on the care for people from home phenomenon in this, in this company because we have a unique way of doing it. We, this team of experts concept, we actually put our people physically together in a pod at our customer experience centers so they can collaborate, own a customer issue and solve it before that customer is ever transferred and it's, a, it's an innovation. Well, that, because of that, we weren't really focused on work from home before all this hit, and we had to immediately pivot. Our care team found a way to work from home for 95% of our people in a matter of weeks with help from the best IT team uh, in this industry. And that, that's just an example. You know, we had to close all, nearly all of our stores, the vast majority of our stores, just close them at the beginning of this. And um, because we didn't know, we didn't understand about masks, we couldn't get our hands on masks, cleaning supplies, anything. All this was just crashing so fast. So we just closed 
and sent people home to keep them safe and kept a sporadic number of stores open because of the essential service that we provide. Um, and then we, we found a way. You know, we, our team found a way to get protective equipment and cleaning and masks and best practices implemented and all kinds of protocols. And within weeks, we were back up and running again. And it's just an example of the ingenuity of this team. So I, you know, look, I draw inspiration you know, from the very fact that if, if you're going to have the world throw all kinds of stuff your way, the way we did, and I'll personalize it the way I did, taking responsibility of the, for this company as CEO on April 1st after many years, show up with a great team, you know, and that'll solve a lot. Yeah. You know, that, that really resonates with me because one, one thing that I've always believed is that great teams are really proven and demonstrated, not when things are going really well, but when they're hard. And uh, you're, you know, you're exactly right. When you look at what's happened the course of this last seven or eight months, it really is a reinforcement of how great of a team, how great people we have, because they've just been so resilient um, and they've been so focused on the job at hand, which is taking care of customers. It's been really exciting. Yeah, and it's it's taken a toll too. You know, it's um, it, I draw inspiration from watching my coworkers, but I know it's not easy. And you know, you can see that people are getting tired. Uh, they miss each other, and it's just, you know, we have to find new ways to get ourselves up every morning and, and make ourselves as productive as we always used to be and find ways to solve complex problems and have conflicts and resolve them and move the ball forward. All these new things we've had to come up with, and you know what? It's exhausting, yeah. and, uh, you know, you can feel that on our team. Yeah. So I, I'm really um, proud of them but I'm also anxious to start to find ways to get them uh, back into some kind of a combination of what we're doing now and safely finding ways to collaborate in person again. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to 21, that's for sure. Yeah. I think we all are. Spe speaking of that, when you, when you think about, I mean, you mentioned the innovations like in customer care where we went from literally no people working outside of the physical call center location to much of the team working at home. Some of these innovations that happen unexpectedly because of COVID. Are there other things that you see that we've done, innovations we've had or ways that we work that you think could carry forward and be a part of our uh, operating model going forward? You know, I think no matter where you work, um, aspects of 2020 are going to stick with us forever. This year has been that discontinuous in terms of its impact on our society, on how we work, on how we communicate with each other, the norms that have crept in. Now, one mistake that, that leaders and managers can always make is to over-extrapolate the present into the future. And I, I don't think it's going to always be like 2020, but there will be pieces of inspiration that we'll draw in the future as to how we work. And one thing we've learned, for example, at T-Mobile, is that dis regardless of what we may have thought before 2020, you know, we can work productively remotely. And that's a big learning. And so I think with that confidence now that 2020 forced us to create, we weren't interested in creating confidence about remote work, especially for office workers, um, but we created it. And now we know it works. And so our future work models in this company will be inspired by what we've been through. They won't be like this but they'll be inspired by it. Let me give you an example. I, you know, as we, we recently communicated to our team in a memo, some thoughts about how we see work happening post pandemic, which I hope starts to take root before the middle of the year. And what we see is a hybrid approach going forward where people in our team who can do their job remotely will be free to do that at least some of the time if they want to. And therefore, the purpose of our physical facilities will change. The, the purpose of our facility used to be primarily to house each person with their own private workstation and then some collaboration. Well, now, your private workstation work, you'll have the choice more, more times than not of doing that either at the office or remotely. And therefore, the purpose of our facilities will become much more centered around collaboration and community. And at a company like T-Mobile, Collaboration and community is really, really important. And that's another thing we've learned in 2020, how hard it's been without being together. And so we aren't envisioning much purely remote work going forward, even though that's how a lot of our employees are working today. Um, maybe there will be some of that on an exception basis, but we're envisioning three flavors of work, all of which are somewhat hybrid. People who are mostly at the office, people who are like half and half, and people who are mostly at home, but still come into the office about weekly. And that, that way, everybody's dipping in to our culture 
and to our collaboration, to be able to solve problems, be creative, support and help each other, have a laugh near the coffee station, all those things that help to perpetuate a culture that's as unique as T-Mobile's. And so we're working all that stuff through and it has implications for how we run the company and also for our physical spaces, like this amazing place here that we've just renovated our campus um, very fortuitously with, with this concept, you know, really being now prepared to be enabled. Yeah. It actually allows people to meet each other too, because yeah. you forget, you know, we've we've been at one company for over six months and half of us haven't even met each other before. And so much of that happens in this physical office space. And I think people are so hungry to have that back again. Imagine our leadership team, you know, on our on our most senior team, my team, mm -hmm. there's 18 of us. And of course, some of whom I've worked with for many, many years, very, very closely like you and I, um, and others uh, who came in from Legacy Sprint. And you know, as a team, just our leadership team, running this $150 billion company. We've never been in a room together, ever, not even yeah. once. And here we are, killing it, yeah. you know? And it's, uh, yeah. yeah, how it's, can you not be inspired by that? It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanna shift topics a little bit. Uh, you mentioned a second ago, you and I have worked together for a long time. And one of the things that I've seen from you in our time working together, um, which I, I really have seen a contrast because I worked here before uh, you were here as well. Um, one of the things that you brought to T-Mobile um, was a uh, kind of a, uh, a new value or a new culture of taking risks. Uh, one of the things that uh, you, you came in and, and made it really clear was we're going to be a company that takes smart risks. And there's lots of examples of, of that happening in the, over the past eight years since, since you've been here. And I just wanted to ask you about uh, risk taking and how important you think risk taking is and how you think about risk taking uh, as the, the leader of this company. Well, you have been with the company for a long time. You know, I feel like I've been here for a long time, and I don't think I've been here for even nearly half your tenure. Uh, you've worked here since the late 70s. Am I correct? Am I, is my math on that? Okay, yeah, I mean, it was very, very different labor laws back then. Yeah, um, yeah listen, I, I, uh, when I joined in 2012, uh, along with John Ledger just a few weeks after him, you know, what I saw, I came in to be chief marketing officer, as you mentioned earlier, and uh, to really bring... Uh, for him, uh, some industry expertise. And, you know, he, he brought this incredible portfolio of CEO experience, public company CEO experience, and also just this personal leadership capability that we've all been beneficiaries of. And what he needed was somebody uh, to partner with him who was a deep industry expert. And so, we, you know, we made a great, um, a great pair, and he, he really became a great mentor for me, too, um, through those years. And what I saw when I joined in 2012 was a company with a brand that was really um, interested in serving customers and was known for customer service and for being a good deal and a good value. Um, but there was an opportunity to bring all that to a higher stage and to bring meaning to it, real meaning to the idea of what it's like to serve customers. And in order to do that, you have to have a mantra, you have to have a belief system, and our belief was listen to customers and change this industry in ways that benefit them. Structural changes, big changes, and deliver fame for our company by doing that. Now, in order to do that, you can't take a business that's been running, which, by the way, ha wasn't really um, successful either. It was a business that had some good attributes like value and customer service, but didn't have business success and financial success. And so big changes were needed. And in order to create that kind of fame, a brand with real meaning um, that, that was deeply known for changing an industry in customers' favor, treating them right, changing the rules, well, you got to take big steps. And we had the benefit of financial unsuccess. <laughs> you know, when, when, you, when you can are in a business that's declining by a couple million customers a year and has negative revenue growth and negative EBITDA growth, you can take risks. And so it wasn't that hard uh, to bring that mindset here. Now, we were fully owned at that time by Deutsche Telekom, and there was some work to do because their mindset um, you know, was, was from an incumbent sort of point of view. Um, but we worked through all that together as a team and started making moves. And you, know, and you were, uh, you know, in asking the question, I mean, you were one of the architects of what we now call the uncarrier. And you know, people don't know this who are your viewers uh, because you're, you're, for years now, since I think I asked you to take responsibility for business back in 2015. So for years now, you know, you've been running our business side. But before that, you were a big part of the architecture of this whole concept of being the uncarrier. And one of our first moves that you were deeply involved in was the idea of totally rethinking uh, how devices work. 
the idea that um, instead of devices, the cost of them being hidden in your rate plan, that we'd bring real transparency to it and allow you to have interest-free loans to pay for your devices separately so you could understand the value of the service and the value of the device. And that was a, a huge foundational thing. And part of all that was when you can do that, you don't need contracts. And so we banished contracts with Uncarrier One. And I remember when we uh, were in meetings with our um, owners at the time who became our board, this was a huge decision. Get rid of contracts? Isn't that what keeps people here after we invest in their device? The contract, that's our safety net. And then we said, not only do we want to do that, but Uncarrier Two, and we had both planned before we started, was this idea of being able to upgrade whenever you want. Do you remember that? So back then the industry made you wait a long time before you could upgrade. Why? Because we made a big investment in your device and it's not going to be profitable, we thought, if you could upgrade when you want. And we said, but that's what customers want. Remember, this was way back in the part of the industry uh, early in the LTE cycle. So, you know, um, big screen phones were new, LTE enabled phones were new, people wanted new, and the industry was holding them back. And so we said, that's not what we're going to do. And we invented Jump, Just Upgrade My Phone, Anytime Upgrades. And it was mind-blowing, billion-dollar implications, existential implications. I mean, these are things that, these contracts are why people stay, right? And um, we had to convince ourselves to leap off that ledge. And, and what it's really about, smart risk-taking, like what we've done at T-Mobile, what it's really about is not just trusting ourselves, but trusting our customers. Because these are investments in them. And what we're doing is we're saying, look, if I give you, if I give you a service with no contracts, or the ability to upgrade when you want, or our third one, the ability to travel to any country for free with nothing to sign up for, the world is your, is your coverage area, that you'll reinvest in us, that you'll stay, you'll deepen your relationship with us, you'll tell other people about us, and fame for our brand will result as the uncarrier. And that was the leap. The leap wasn't in our capabilities or our ability to assess things. It was a leap about trusting customers that if we invest in them, they'll invest right back in us. And here we are years later, you know, as a massively successful company, a proof uh, that that kind of thesis when executed well really can work. Yeah. I want to ask you more about that trust in customers because I think it's such an important part of what, what this, this company is and what it's done. Um, and a lot of people may not know um, how much customers have influenced the things that we've done, not done, or changed. Uh, and it might be interesting for, to, for people to hear that about that from you because there's a lot of things that we've done that we've uh, eventually stopped doing or changed because of customers. It'd be great to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, or things we never thought we could do that were inspired by customers. You know, um, I remember when we did our, um, our fifth uncarrier move, uncarrier five was called music freedom. And, you know, data networks were becoming more robust and people were all mired in these rate plans that counted every little bit up. And music streaming was taking off like nuts. Remember, we used to have stored music only. And music streaming really took off in the mid 2000s with Spotify and Apple pivoting all to streaming. And, Everybody wanted to stream music. And so we did Music Freedom and became the first company that, as an uncarrier move, and said, you can stream all you want. It'll never count against your data bucket. And we thought, man, we solved it. That's incredible. Yeah, we did it. Woo, big breakthrough. And it was. But you know what customers said? What about video? Why can't we do that? Why can't we stream video for free? <laughs> and you know what? The greatest thing about serving customers is that Honestly, customers are insatiable. Um, you know, you can't ever fully, fully satisfy them. All you can do is strive for perfection. And I love that about the pursuit of true customer love. And I think we're way ahead of where anybody in this industry has ever been at achieving it. We have the highest net promoter scores, the highest satisfaction rates, but customers are truly unsatisfiable. And I love the pursuit of that perfection. And so they said, do video. Thank you for the music, but we want completely free streaming video because Netflix was becoming more popular then and, and stuff. And we didn't think we could do it. We said, we said, we'll look, we'll study it, it's, et cetera. But that kernel of feedback to how, how the world responded to music freedom, which was incredibly positive, but also what do you, what else you got? <laughs> we went to work and, you know, a year and a half later, we invented binge on 
uh, Uncarrier 10, uh, which is probably our most groundbreaking move ever. And where we said, you know what? We found out a way to make it so that you can stream all the video you want in your rate plan for free and it'll never count against your data bucket. Video streaming at a time when networks didn't have the capacities that they do today in 2020. We were the first to do it. It was a massive breakthrough. It took a huge technology innovation to make it possible and a, and a, a handshake with customers about what they would need to do. And um, it's just an example of when you really listen to customers, they lead you to a place we didn't think we could go, but we found a way for them. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about one other kind of risk taking. Um, and it's something that I've uh, seen you demonstrate many times, so I'd love to hear more about it from you, which is uh, taking risks on people and how important that has been for you uh, in your uh, leadership success. You know, it's one of my, um, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> and uh, as a leader, um, I wouldn't say I'm the world's best interviewer, like for me, it's this real artificial thing to sit down with somebody you don't know for 45 minutes and decide if they've got what it takes to lead a big part of your business and if you want to work closely with them for years to come. I, I personally am not that good at it. Some people are amazing at it. Um, but what I do feel like I've learned to do is to um, figure out among the people I do work with, who are the people that ought to be running the company? Who are the people with unlimited potential? And um, you know, and that's, that's something I'm proud of. And so I do, I do take chances on people who have proven it. And to me, the, some of the most effective leaders and powerful leaders are people who, you know what, when they start the job, they feel like they have something to prove. And you know, I've been there over and over again. It might be why I lead this way to the premise of your question. I was, um, when I was asked to lead marketing at E-Trade, which was a hot.com in the 90s, uh, I was still in my 20s. And you know, they wanted somebody with my kind of background. I had, had Procter & Gamble background, so classic marketing, but also a technology background at IBM. They were looking for that combination. There weren't a lot of people with that combination. I was really young and unproven, but they gave me the job uh, in, in 1998. And a few years later, I became chief marketing officer at AT&T Wireless um, at 32. And so, and people in both those cases, um, there was a person involved who, took a risk because I, my resume didn't say I was ready for either of those jobs, not even close to be a CMO of a you know, Fortune 50, Fortune 100 company at that age. But they took a risk, they took a chance, and that just made me feel like I have to prove them right. And you, know, you just bring so much passion and energy. Um, and so for me, I, I love that. Um, that. That's not to say, that I don't also pick people who've done it um, over and over and over again. If you look at our leadership team, there's 18 of us, and we're, we're just this fantastic blend of people who've been at it for many, many years, people who've, been co who've come up in recent years up the curve as senior executives. We all bring a different perspective. Some are pretty new with T-Mobile, and some, like you, have been here super, super long. And I love that because we, we create a really great, diverse team with different perspectives that way. If, if you were giving somebody advice about t taking risk on people, like what, 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 what would be the things that you would have them think about? Well, first, um, you got to pick people who are willing to take a risk on themselves. You know, ultimately, career management is, for each of us as we pursue our careers, we have to, if, if we want to have more and more responsibility over time, and not everybody does, but if that's what we want for our careers, we have to be willing to take risks on ourselves and try things that we haven't done over and over again, um, and be willing to fail and get good over time. We have to find mentors who are willing to foster that in us, who see that in us, and who are willing to come along and risk with us, um, take a bet on us. And so it's a two-way street. And that's the advice I'd give you know, to a leader. Find people coming up the experience curve, young or old, uh, in, this, in, a, in a particular domain space, who are willing to go out, step out, try things. Uh, you know, ultimately, that's part of what makes our whole company work. You know, I, I, for years, when we were at Standalone T-Mobile, I would tell our team, someday, one day, we're gonna be as big or bigger than AT&T and Verizon, but we must never become them. We must never become like them. And what I'm talking about when I, when I used to give that speech, of course, now we're number two. We've surpassed AT&T. 
It makes what, I, what I've been talking about all these years even more important, which is the mindset of being able to take smart risks and step out and try things, and also the mindset around when that happens, how we support each other. Because when you get in a really big company, the tendency is not only to not take risks, but the tendency is to slap people down who do. And, and it's a self-perpetuating thing. In fact, the tendency is for the enemy to be down the hall. Uh, and, and you don't want to step out or that guy might crush you. That's, that's when companies start to fail. And so that's what we've guarded against all along here. You know, our, I won't say enemy, but our opponents are the guys at those other companies. You know, they're over there. They're not down the hall. We're a team. And so being able to foster that and support each other. We try things. And you know what? I love to come to sessions like this and tell you all the success stories. But we've tried lots of things that kind of didn't work out the way we had hoped. That's OK. We pick ourselves up. You know, we've, we learn some things. We celebrate it. Sometimes we shoot off a confetti cannon and we move right on to the next thing. And we never look back, So, uh, other than to take on board the lessons. So um, yeah, you know, it's about finding people who are willing to take a chance on themselves and being willing uh, to take a chance on them. Yeah. You know, we've, we've talked a lot kind of looking back at 2020. And uh, in many ways, it feels like it's been a really, really long year. Um, but if you, you know, think about it in relative terms, this company is new. I mean, it's, it's a six-month-old company. And so when you start thinking ahead into 2021 and beyond, what are some of the things that you're really excited about? And what, what's next? What's next for this new T-Mobile? Well, you know, I, we're talking um, here in December of 2020 at what I think we're within a month or two of what I would call the dawn of the 5G era. You know, the 2020s are going to be the 5G decade. And I think our opportunity is to not only transform people's lives and how they communicate, collaborate um, around the world, but our opportunity as an industry um, is, is to connect people in ways they've never been connected. And for us as a company, it's a leadership opportunity. You, you know, in, in 2010, when 4G LTE came to this industry, uh, Verizon was way out in front in the US. And, um, you know, we didn't know what uh, 4G would become, but the companies plunged themselves into it. And the mobile lifestyle that we all have today resulted. You know, it's, it's funny to live in 2020 and we act like this mobile lifestyle has been around forever, but it hasn't. When, when we were building 4G LTE technology, I was at Clearwire, which is now part of our company. Um, we really thought that 4G would be about loading pictures faster on picture phones, because that was the world we knew. Smartphones were just taking off. They weren't a way of life. Um, we didn't have Uber you know, at scale. We didn't have um, Snapchat. We didn't, you know, the big companies like Facebook and Google hadn't pivoted their whole strategies yet around mobile, at least not successfully yet. And so we, the mistake was to extrapolate that present into the future. And what happened instead was all those companies, Apple, Google, Facebook, the most valuable companies in the world, completely transformed around mobile. And then um, innovators in garages, real, metaphorically and, and, and literally, um, became some of the most um, lifestyle-changing companies uh, in, our, in our digital history, and like Uber, you know, or Tinder, or uh, Snapchat, or Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. And so, obviously, 4G was a transformative technology. In 2020, we've, at scale, we've really used video telephony. That really came about through 4G. Before 4G, nobody ever did video telephony. It took, it took um, Hangouts and uh, iMessage and um, FaceTime to make those things at scale technologies. Okay, so here we are at the dawn of the 5G era. And I'm telling you this, if 4G was transformative for our lifestyles, 5G will be more transformative. The only mistake would be to try to assume that it's all going to happen exactly like it's happening now. Our, our smartphones will be a little faster or a lot faster, and that's it. Um, what's going to happen is innovators will take this massive capability that we're now building, that T-Mobile will clearly lead for the 5G era, and they'll create hardware and software solutions using these high-capacity, low-latency networks that transform our connected lives yet again. And I love that. I just love it. It's, you know, to me, it's, it's a reminder that the work we do is really important. You know, our company is setting out to be the best 
in the world at connecting people to their world. And we've got the team, we've got the assets, and now we're way ahead of our two principal competitors in the 5G race, and we intend to stay ahead for the entirety of the 5G decade. And to me, that's really exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's really exciting, especially when you put it in that terms, when you think about the beginning of 4G, having no idea what was actually gonna define that era and it happening over the course of 10 years and thinking about that same cycle again um, and having technology that's been as disruptive and transformational um, and groundbreaking as what's happened over that last decade just kind of blows your mind. And for what, the first time, being able to envision it with T-Mobile as the leader. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, for someone like you who's worked here for many, many years, you know, we've been chasing everybody else for decades. And now for us to start this incredibly important 5G era as the leader and with the wherewithal to remain the leader through the entirety of it and become famous as the best network in this country, that's our opportunity. Yeah. It's just, it's an amazingly exciting moment. What, what is it that gives us that advantage in this, in this era relative to previous eras? I mean, when we merged the companies, we brought together not only the teams, but the networks. And, and the assets that those two companies own. And they just happened to, why we chased this merger for so many years and worked on it so hard against so much opposition was because we knew how incredibly synergistic uh, the two companies were. And they just happened to have very, very different assets that when you combine them together, create a power that's much more than one plus one equals two. Most mergers are one plus one equals less than two. <laughs> Let's be honest. That's why they're sort of side-eyed by everybody. Uh, this is totally different. When you take the low-band leadership that T-Mobile had and the mid-band leadership that Sprint had and you put them together and you put very high capacity millimeter wave on top, more of it than everybody else, and the network resources of the two companies, more towers than anybody else, and the financial synergies of combining the two companies that give us the capital to invest behind all that. You know, so when you, when you no longer require American consumers and businesses to pay for two totally separate networks, and instead you combine them into one, your costs go way down. And when your costs go way down, you can do two things. You can invest billions, tens of billions, in the world's best 5G network, and you can simultaneously provide the best value. That's how powerful these financial synergies are. No one's ever in this industry, in history, been able to simultaneously offer you the best network and the best value. That's T-Mobile's opportunity. Mm -hmm. You combine that with the ability, our long legacy of offering the best experiences from the best team that cares about and loves customers the most, man, that's a winning combination. Uh, it's, it's, it's so exciting, and I know we've got a team here that's really fired up, and any customer that's been a part of it knows, knows exactly what you're talking about. Um, you know that you reached out to uh, your Twitter followers and asked them for some questions. Do you mind taking some rapid-fire <laughs> questions from your Oh, from your oh is this that rapid-fire? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we, got, we have yeah. some really good, very, very important. Well, I didn't look at it. Very uh, important ones. Okay. Um, so let's, let's, you know, let's start with an easy one. Uh, pineapple on pizza? I'm an equal opportunity pizza person. It's not my go-to, but yeah, 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 yeah. it's allowed. <laughs> um, you know, staying, staying in the, uh, the food category, favorite road trip or gas station snack? Uh, uh, hands down, baked Lay's. Best salted snack in the history of mankind, no, no doubt. And you put it right next to Pringles, you always thought you liked Pringles, no, no. Yeah. You get the baked Lay's, nothing like it. Now, here's the problem with baked Lay's though. You open the bag sometimes and you find 7.5 potato chips. They need to work on that. But it's the best salted snack ever invented. Oh, and it's healthy too, right? I mean, yeah, it's baked. Yeah. It's baked. <laughs> um, if you were a small business owner, what would your business be? I kind of am, or at least my family yeah. is. Um, my brother and sister-in-law have, have a brewery in Kirkland, Kirkland's leading brewery called Chainline. And Suzanne and I are involved in a tangential way. And that's, a, that's the kind of business that makes sense to me. You know, if you're, if you're into food and beverage, um, like chain line brewing, like coffee companies, um, you know, a business that's about bringing people together and creating community and celebrating good times, that puts a smile on people's face. Well, staying in the, uh, the drink category, and I, know, and I know you're a big coffee drinker, favorite coffee roast? Um, our favorite roaster is Zoka, uh, which is a local roaster here in the area. I usually buy their Tangletown blend. Uh, but if you uh, press me on single origins, I'd say um, real earthy, dark Sumatra and Indo in Indonesian single origin stuff, or maybe Costa Rican 
which is a little more balanced. Sometimes you can find some great stuff there. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really into it. A good French press is the best way to start. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why. It's 3 o'clock and dark outside, so I don't know why you'd be so into it. Uh, favorite book or podcast? I mean, besides this podcast, favorite book or podcast? Yeah, I, uh, I'll go book instead of podcast. I, um, I like popular history. Um, so uh, like David McCullough kind of stuff or uh, like he wrote The Wright Brothers or uh, some of the ones about... Lewis and Clark, or our founding fathers, those kinds of things. Popular history, I love it. Um, and, uh, but also I like sort of these broad arc of history books, like Jared Diamond books, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and Collapse, and all the ones he did, or Sapiens, some of those ones that look at the arc of time and try to draw conclusions about the society we live in now, those kinds of things. And then sometimes some, some page-turning historical, you know, fiction kind of stuff, too. Uh, I'll wrap with this one. Favorite T-Mobile product or uncarrier move? Whoa, um, you know I'll go. I'll go back to Ben John. I, you know, that was uh, we've done something like seventeen, eighteen of them. That that one was my favorite because it just came so much from the heart of our customers, as I explained earlier. Um, the other, another one that was really fun for me because I could just see the jaws dropping at our competitors was um, uncarrier three, simple global. When we, when we just, with no warning, suddenly decided that the world is your, is your coverage area far free and there's nothing to sign up for. Just from now on, you go to Canada, Mexico, get off the plane in Europe, Asia, doesn't matter, it's included. Um, that blew people's minds and it, and it also destroyed multi-billion dollar profit pools at our competitors over time, which is a win-win in my mind. <laughs> it's one of our other favorite things to do. <laughs> Uh, well, Mike, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this, um, and, but, but even more than that, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, your leadership, what you've done for this entire company, uh, what you've done for me personally. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, I, I couldn't be more lucky than to have this opportunity to work here, and I know there's thousands of people across this company that feel the same way. So thank you. Thanks, man. Yeah, and thanks for taking care of business. Yeah, see what I did there. <laughs> ah, perfect, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, it was a great season of taking care of business, and we we're really looking forward to coming back next year with the next one. Have a great day.